Bill alluded to uh, people who don't approach this entire hobby the same way he does, and I'm one of those. Uh, the uh, I, I I think my problem is I'm just got a little too much ADD. You know, I, I'm not going to commit anything to memory that I don't have to. Uh, the stuff I remember is because I keep running across it, you know, repetitively. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and I've and I've been a tinkerer. I've been making stuff since long. My, and I'm an electrical engineer. My engineering started way before school did, though. My dad was a ham radio operator, and I, my toys were big variable capacitors out of old radios. I thought those were the coolest things in the world. Um, and, you know, stuff that was in my dad's shop laying around, uh, uh, including the, the occasional charged capacitor that you uh, <laughs> 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 you, you learn quick uh, with those kind of situations. <laughs> Don't do that again. Um, but anyway, I, you know, so I've been playing with electronics and stuff all my life, and it's fun for me. I, I enjoy it. So the idea when I got into, and astronomy for me was a, um, a it started out as my, uh, photography. You know, I was into photography as a teenager and, and longer lenses, and, and I've always been almost blind as a bat. So anything I could do to see better, was cool. So long lenses, telescopes, binoculars were all kind of fun. Uh, but uh, in the early 90s, I heard about a comet that was going to crash into Jupiter. And I thought, well, I, I need a front row seat to that. I know enough about it to know that's probably a once in a lifetime event. And so I want to check this out. I uh, stumbled across a great deal on a very expensive telescope and uh, and I bought it and I had uh, we didn't have a good view that night when Shoemaker Levy 9 crashed into Jupiter but the following nights we did and you could still see the the big black ring uh, spots on Jupiter as they rotated around and I got to see that from my backyard, from my driveway, with my own telescope, um, and I was hooked. You know, at that point, uh, although at that point I've got this 300-pound telescope I just spent a couple grand on that uh, I know how my hobbies go. And all too often, the stuff gets pushed over in a corner or up in the attic, and that thing wasn't going to fit in the attic. And besides, <laughs> if I didn't continue to use it, my wife would probably shoot me. So uh, uh, I decided I'd get involved with Memphis Astronomical Society, and uh, I've been doing this ever since. Um, back in those days, there were no go-to telescopes. There, I'm not sure there were any within, with encoder systems built on them then. Might might have been, uh, but it was certainly a do-it-yourself sort of thing. Uh, they weren't much, there wasn't much available in commercially available equipment. <clears throat> Today, that's not the same case. Today, you can buy a fully automated telescope. And by that, I mean, you can, uh, there's a, I think, Mead light switch uh, telescopes started around two grand for an eight inch model you can take it outside, set it down in its place, turn on the switch, come back in about 30 minutes and tell it what you want to look at and it'll go right to it. They don't take any star alignments, nothing. They have a built-in camera, they do their own star alignments. Uh, it's, it's, it's really cool tech, uh, if that's what you want. But they're expensive, you know, you're starting this is a beginner scope at two grand, and, uh, and so that's, uh, but it's doable. There are go-to telescopes starting below $200. Uh, as you can see my opinion about those things uh, right there. 
um, it, you start, you got to get above $500 to even, cons even be in the ballpark of having something that might be worth having uh, in, this, in this range. And that's going to be small aperture. And I'm not a small aperture kind of guy. I like big telescopes. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, is having the ability for the telescope to go point itself that important? You know, honestly, all I really want to do is know what I'm pointed at or how to find what it is Bill's told you another way of going about doing. I want to be able to just push, I want this computer, I want the device tell me which way I got to push this thing and when I'm pointed at what I'm looking for. And that can be done. Um, and, and by the way, and I said this in my in the thing I put on our website. In in photography, the the uh, the old knowledge was the money goes in the glass. And what they mean by that is uh, the most money you're going to spend on this hobby should go in in the optical system. That's where the views are going to be. It's kind of like stereos. Honest to God, the money goes in the speakers. Most people don't actually know that. Money goes in the speakers. Everything else is easy. Um, so money goes in the glass. And if you're going to spend a bunch of money on an inexpensive go-to telescope, all that's going into the tech and not the glass. And so it's, it's an upside-down thing in presently, in my opinion. <clears throat> you can take a, you can buy a used, very good optics system and put encoders on it and have all the tech you want, a computer-guided telescope that, that will easily show you what you want to look at with all the glass that you need and, <clears throat> and, and save a whole lot of money. Um, what I do like about it is, um, you know, after I got through looking at about everything I could look at out in the dark skies, one of the things that gives me the most pleasure out of astronomy anymore is being able to show other people, especially children. And to do that, dragging a bunch of kids out under dark skies is not handy. It's not easy. We don't do it. We got... We wind up having to go to schools to do this, schools with parking light, lights in the city, and this stuff gets hard to find in light polluted skies. So being able to have encoders that'll actually help you find this stuff in light polluted skies can be a great time saver. And that's another thing when you're dealing with kids, they got no patience. <laughs> so being able to move a telescope quickly from one item to the next is handy. So digital setting circles, <clears throat> and, and in case uh, the, the, the word setting circles comes from before they were digital, right? <clears throat> Back in the day, there were actually scales drawn on, the, on different components of the telescope to show you what angle that telescope was pointed at, the declination axis, the right ascension axis, they, and depending on the size of the telescope, they had big old scales that were on them that showed with pointers that showed you where you were at. <clears throat> this is a digital version of that. And by that, we mean encoders. And uh, and, and this, is, uh, an this is an encoder. This device right here, what happened to my pictures? Oh, there they are. Um, this is an encoder, right? You've got optical encoders in your hand every day if you're playing with a, with a mouse or a computer at all. Anymore, they're a little more tricky than they used to be, but back in, they used to have a rubber ball inside them that turned two little uh, axes at right angles, and those had little wheels on the ends of them with holes in them that a light beam shines through.
to count pulses as the light is, uh, beam is broken and allowed to pass through, the photo eye picks it up, it generates pulses, and those pulses look like uh, this. Now, encoders come in all shapes and sizes. This one, uh, the, uh, the knobs on your uh, radio in your car, you know, that one that doesn't, uh, that doesn't quit turning. Back in the day, you know, variable resistors, volume controls, had a, had a distinct stop and start, right? They go from here to here, and that was it, you know? I liked those. <laughs> now, uh, they all got, they're encoders, and they just don't quit turning, you know? Their position is relative to something going on, and that's most of your volume controls and stuff in modern stereos and what have you are actually optical encoders. This is uh, an encoder that shows you, uh, the, the reason for this slide, this slide here is to show you how an, enco an encoder can tell you which way it's turning. So if you're just generating pulses, then you're just generating pulses. How do you know whether you're generating pulses this way or that way? And it's a trick called quadrature and you've got two channels and you can do it, there's all kinds of ways of doing it. You can offset uh, the, the light sensor, the receiver, so that it picks up the uh, pulses at different times through the same set of uh, slots, or you can have multiple sets of slots. At the end of the day, what it amounts to is you've got two channels of pulses that are offset and it's whether one channel is leading the other when it goes high or not in its uh, state or charge, uh, it tells you which way it's turning. So enough about quadrature. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time. I put my first set of encoders on my, that Parks telescope that I talked about spending a lot of money on. It did not have encoders. It had a nice clock drive, but that was it. Uh, this is not a direct connection system. This used uh, toothed belts like you have in engine timing systems and stuff, so you get positive transfer of motion. There's no slippage. There's no chance of slipping. It's like a chain drive, but it doesn't make any noise. Um, this is the right ascension clock drive. The, uh, this is the mechanical setting circle, and there it is for the declination. Um, that's the uh, little computer that I used to have on it. This just is a catalog. There's a catalog of planets, Messier objects, and about, I don't know, several thousand NGC objects loaded in on, on a chip in this little box to, and it'll tell you which way to push the telescope to go find them. I hate this thing. <laughs> uh, there had to be a better way. Anyway, this is a uh, right ascension drive installation. Uh, this, is, this is the telescope I use now most of the time in most of our public observing sessions. This is a Dobsonian mount with a azimuth uh, encoder that's, you know, if you have one of these, you know that the, the base pedal is on a, what might be called a lazy Susan kind of thing. There's a pivot point in the middle. And all you have to do is fix that pivot point so the bolt at the bottom so that nut won't turn, all right? So you put the, uh, you've got a plate with the nut welded to it and you put that in place, then you run the bolt down through it with an encoder attached to it. And if you, it might be hard to see, but there's a little set screw. So that bolt has a hole drilled in it. So the end of the shaft of this encoder fits down in there. And then uh, uh, the set screw holds that tight. That's, those encoders have been on that telescope for 20 years plus. And about two or three years ago, I find it started acting up really bad. And it took me a day or two to realize that after 20-something years, that little set screw had gotten loose. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't uh, turning the encoder like it should. 
Uh, this is the declination mount, the declination encoder installation. And this, the deal here is that basically the encoder is fixed on the declination pivot wheel. And there's a rod here. This has got a little rubber uh, O-ring inside it. You connect that to that uh, encoder shaft sticking out, and that just holds it in place. So that as you tilt the uh, telescope, the encoder will tilt with it, but the, the shaft is held in place by this rod. My intentions tonight were to bring, in fact, it's in the back of my truck. I just couldn't get it around this corner down here. Uh, so the telescope's out there. If you're interested in seeing this in more detail, we can look at it after the meeting. Um, I'm going to get to some really exciting parts here in a minute that I discovered in preparing for this presentation. Here are the uh, typical standalone computers that you normally can get. You can certainly, uh, there's this little guy, there's a better one called the NGC Max. This is $800. That's stupid. <laughs> this is why this guy's not in business anymore. Actually, he is, and you can still actually get these. Uh, but it's just way too expensive. Uh, this little JN, JMI micro uh, computer was well over $300 when, when it was new. You actually can still get them. Uh, Argo Navis, this is an Australian company that built something very similar. They're really on the expensive side too. This one, uh, I forgot about, I don't know much about these. This one's from Celestron, similar design and function. The big thing is you don't need these anymore. You can do these with apps on your cell phone or your apps on the iPad. And if you've ever seen my setup out at uh, night, I'm a big fan of sticking my iPad on top of my telescope and hooking it up to it and letting it show me what I'm looking at. And I love it. <clears throat> but you've got to somehow or another get the encoders to talk to the computer. And that is all about this little box right here. This, this is uh, called a B box. Uh, that's this right here. I've had this for 25 years or more. And they, they don't make them anymore. These are impossible to find. Uh, but a guy named David Eck uh, wrote a little program. There's a set of, uh, if you're into electronics at all, uh, there are all kinds of, after transistors became, you know, uh, integrated circuits, and then there were very large scale integrated circuits. And what they finally figured out was, you know, we can make chips that are actually programmable circuits, right? So that you, you don't have to decide that this chip's going to be an AM radio, and this chip's going to be a decoder, and this chip's going to do this, and manufacture special purpose chips. You can make chips that you can just program to do whatever you want. And that whole, there's a whole range of those. There's a group of them that the hobbyists got into called PIC. Uh, and uh, David Eck created a uh, program that runs on there, that run, uh, PICs were programmed with basic uh, language. And they sell this kit. Uh, I have a, a uh, this is my spare in case my B box ever craps out on me. I have a David Eck uh, serial uh, encoder interface with the PIC controller, and there's the version number of the software on it. And uh, the kit was like 30 bucks. It's, Is that like a Raspberry Pi? Uh, you could, okay. but nobody has, so it makes it a little more difficult. Yeah, this was, yeah, weren't, yeah. In fact, you'd probably m be more likely to do something like this with an Arduino than the Raspberry Pi. Um, Raspberry Pi is way too powerful for this. Um, what's, what is real cool, and I just bought two of them, is that uh, he does a USB version now. This kit, which if you, I mean, if you're afraid of a soldering iron, I'll solder it for you. Uh, in about, it'd take an hour to put this thing together. 20 bucks. 
comes with the programmed IC and everything you need to get started with the USB encoder interface. <clears throat> and when, when I, I offered to put this program together, I had done this before uh, years and years ago. And I thought, well, all I'm going to do is get out my old uh, presentation, and dust it off, update some links, and throw it up on the screen. I started looking around at stuff and what's still available and what wasn't. And I stumbled across something that I think if you've got a Dobsonian telescope and you don't do this, I don't know what you're doing. This guy, this, there's an outfit out of China that builds these. And these are 90 bucks, but they're wireless encoder interfaces, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, depending on which way you want to go. So if you've been around... Apple products or, or uh, uh, what's the other one? Android. Android products. You know that if you want to do wireless with Apple, it ought to be Wi-Fi. Uh, Apple's implementation of Bluetooth, they are so security uh, overconscious in that respect that getting stuff to work with their Bluetooth is tough. But their Wi-Fi, not as much. Uh, Android is big on Bluetooth connectivity, and so you might want a Bluetooth uh, model if you're doing an Android. But the idea is to use your cell phone or iPad or laptop computer with these things, and uh, it's all wireless, um, pre-built, no soldering on these. Um, so. I'll do a, a demonstration real quick of how this works with my iPad. Let me do that now. Um, what kind of batteries do you use? My wireless adapter uh, uses uh, double A's and the uh, uh, the encoder interface uh, uses 9 volt. This is a Orion a uh, Starseek Wi-Fi controller module. This works with a bunch of different kinds of telescopes. I probably never would have bought it. It's a little on the expensive side, but it came with an Orion mount I bought secondhand not too long ago. And uh, I actually didn't even think about using this with this telescope until I, uh, my iPad broke and I had to get a new one. And this new iPad Pro has got a USB-C connector instead of the old lightning connectors. And, uh, and, and none of my serial interfaces would work with it. And so it was like, what am I going to do? I'm going to buy something else. Oh my God. And I, got, I thought, well, what, what about this? So anyway, it works perfect. Let me. Uh... <coughs> now for iPhones, iPads, uh, <coughs> mobile devices, I am a huge fan of Sky Safari. But no matter what it is, pick one. I've got them all. I've, I've been, I'm a software geek. You know, so, so I'm on, I've got the Sky, I've got Sky Safari, I've got all of them, because I'm going to check them all out at some point or another. But at some point, you really need to just pick one and stick with it, because the tr trick is learning how to operate it. You know, it's, uh, uh, <laughs> you need to understand what you're doing. So let me, uh, let me see if it'll just connect. Okay, let me. <coughs> oh. oh. Give me a break. I'm sorry, I must have accidentally turned that thing on while ago. Ran the batteries. Oh, there it is.
Okay. There you go. All right, now, my encoders are telling me that I'm pointed straight up and due north. And uh, just so you know, as much as I love these, these are called chicken head knobs. If you've ever seen those, I guess maybe it kind of looks like a chicken head, maybe. Uh, anyway, I love them, but they're, uh, they're heavy on one side and it won't stay uh, place. So I'm going to set this down like this so that it can point at roughly 35 degrees, which is uh, the North Star and due north. And I'm going to swing my software around here until. <coughs> All right, now I'm going to tell my telescope to connect. And that's where it thought it was pointed. But I'm going to go back here and tell it to see it still selects the North Pole. I'm going to hit Align. All right. Now, and can you see that? Do we need to kill a light or something? I, uh, where are the lights? Okay, is that good? Yeah. All right. All right. So, oh, come on now. There you go. All right. So, what this is, uh, what the, what you're seeing in the way of those rings and stuff up there? Come on. All right. The red rings are the same rings on a telrad. If you've ever used a telrad finder. Uh, it's a little heads-up display that projects a set of concentric rings on the background sky, no magnification. But this tells you this is the same as what you would see in that view. Then the blue ring is the same as the field of view of my 9 millimeter Nagler eyepiece in my 13-inch Coulter telescope. And the, the software, all you got to do is tell it what those pieces are, and it does all the math to calculate all of that up there. Now, if I want to say go over here to, uh, oh wow, look, there's a comet. Uh, so I'm going to go look at, I'm sorry? That's right, yeah. No, uh -uh. I'm not sure what that is even. Yeah, it is a comet. So I want to go over here to that comet. So I'm going to move my point my telescope up from its declination and move toward the east and up some more and lo and behold lock it's just gonna stay on it and when I go to my eyepiece that's gonna be in it. And I didn't spend a thousand dollars on motors to push the telescope to get it to that point. Um, this works very well. Um, I'll, this one of the one of the tricks is this uh, uh, Sky Safari software on a handheld device like a cell phone or an iPad. The beauty of that is you can get away with a one star alignment. Just tell it where it's pointed. Find one thing you know and tell it that that's what the telescope is pointed at. And that's all you need to do. The, the software knows exactly where that device is located because they've all got GPS receivers built into them. It knows exactly what time it is because they've all got GPS receivers built into them. That's where they get their time. And it's got the software in it that says, at this location, 
here's where you point to see this stuff in the sky. And that's what this astronomy software is all about. It's 3D spherical geometry at its finest. And it'll tell you exactly what you're pointed at. And, how, and then, of course, you can do things like go find out information about it, all this other stuff. Uh, you figure out that on your own. Um, but that's just how simple it is. And this is... <coughs> That's just how simple it is. You mount these two devices on your telescope. That can be a little tricky, and there are ways to do it. If you've got an odd situation, uh, I will help you make brackets. I'm, I've got all that machinery and everything needed to do that at my house. Uh, the rest of this is, is easy stuff. <clears throat> But the thing I found in the course of doing all this is really what blew me away. And I'm never really big on promoting one company's stuff. What did I do with my pointer? It's over here. It's over Thank here. you. You're yeah, there it is. <clears throat> this guy. Uh, th uh, these are links, and I'll be glad to put this, uh, email you this presentation, send you any of this information. These are links to David X stuff, the Sky Commanders, and, and all this stuff is here. This is the new thing that is really cool. This is an eBay store for a guy named Nachimi, not a not a Shimi. He's uh, it's it's Chinese. <clears throat> which is a whole series of, of encoder sets specifically designed for some of the most popular Dobsonians out there with the wireless interface and the whole shooting match for $150 to $200. Uh, look, <laughs> these devices were a hundred bucks a piece. That's the most expensive part of a digital encoder system, is the actual encoder itself. Now these prob hopefully these have come down in price since I bought these, uh, but they're identical to the ones on my Dob, and I bought them as spares. Uh, and then I never needed them, so I made it a demonstration unit out of it. But they're a hundred bucks a piece. Uh, come with all the brackets you need? Yeah, it comes with all the brackets comes with their with their encoder interface wireless uh, from China? huh he's from China is that sterilized uh, 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 <laughs> probably uh, Skywatcher Dobbs you know here it is how many of those are out there probably one of the most popular Dobsonians going right now 189 bucks the whole shooting match, it's ready to go. Bolt on and you're done. Uh, so, and they've, they've got some kits for some other kinds of telescopes. Uh, the guy's store is really pretty interesting uh, telescope stuff. But if you've got a dob and you want to put encoders on it, this is the most straightforward way I can imagine. I'd, I want to see somebody do one of these. I can't imagine it being difficult. Yeah? You can help me. That's the very one I'm looking at. I've got a, a Skywatcher collapsible 12 inch Dob, and I want to get the Dobson Dream 8. And so I've got some questions. Is it hard? Uh, is, does it make it harder for takedown at the end of the evening, particularly along the altitude axis? So you've got that encoder no. there. No. Is it hard to take the telescope apart when you're ready to pack up in the evening? Uh, uh, about two and a half, may, maybe 30 seconds more yeah. to get that. What do you do with that encoder then? I'm, I'm curious. Well, the, the encoder in these looks like they stay attached to the arm. That's right. Right? So you just down. take the arm off yeah. and put that in a box and the rest of the telescope goes. Uh, you'll, you'll see, if you want to see mine, we'll go out to the Truck. I've seen yours. Uh, we, we've been out. I, I've, I've seen you use yours. My encoders stay in place, yeah. and the arm snap pops off, so I can take the two apart. 
And the trick on mine is I've got to remember to unplug that wire from my encoder. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times I've forgotten to do that. <laughs> I really want to get that, but if you think that's within the, the realm of my kin to be able to put it together and do it, it looks really simple. I've seen the 16-minute vid on YouTube on how to put that very encoder on your I think it's I think this is the coolest thing since yeah, sliced bread. And then, what can you use it on? You said it has to be Wi-Fi. I've got an I iPhone, so you can see everything on this. If Sky you, Safari. Sky Safari like you do. And, and you're, you're done. I mean, all you got to do is hook, uh, go to your Wi-Fi settings, have it recognize the Sky Safari uh, thing as a Wi-Fi connection, and then when you launch uh, Sky Safari, you'll do a little bit of setup there, but after that, it's just that little telescope control panel. You hit connect, boom, hit, hit, do an alignment to the first star, and you're, you're there for the night. The other thing that wasn't really clear in the, the vid that I watched and also in the literature on cloudy nights, um, I wasn't sure about uh, power source or batteries, how long does that last? Yeah, now that I don't know about yet. Yeah, sound either. Uh, if, it's, if, if we're lucky, it's a rechargeable lithium ion. Yeah. And if that's the case, I'm sure it'll last all night. There's yeah. just, it's just not much there to draw current. Yeah. Absolutely. If I need your help. I'll call you. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I want you to call me anyway. I want to watch you put it. I want to see yeah. it happen. I want to see this one the first time. So that'd be cool. So uh, I know I blew through that pretty quick. Has anybody got any questions? Uh, this is meant to be more of a practical thing. So if you do and you want to are considering doing this, please get in touch with me and I'll be glad to help out. Somewhere I missed what it actually does. I mean, does, is it going to tell you which way to push, or do you push it somewhere and then it tells you what's there? So in this configuration, using an iPad or something like that, mm -hmm. it you 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 can't. What I do with it all the time is I go look at where what it is I want to find, mm -hmm. and then I push it until those circles line up. That's it. Mm -hmm. Now with this device, it actually tell you you know, up or right, left, which direction, until you're there. And then it flashes and tells you you're there. I would, I would be totally at peace with one that you put it on some object using your own ingenuity, and then you would push a button and it would tell you what it was to verify what it was well, of course without it, telling you how to get there. It does that as well, but, in fact, that you can go find something then you're not sure what it is, you look over at your iPad and whatever is under those circles, that's what you're looking at. And you can do that, actually, switch back. Ah, very good, all right, cool. All right, so you know if you just if you're just pushing around the telescope around looking at stuff, and you stumble across something. The comment. Looks like it's in the big Two eighty nine p. Yep. Right by the bear's front feet. Yeah, you already got it oh, selected. It's upside down. Yeah. So 289p. This is this is of course why it's handy to have because now I can find out information about it. Uh, zero magnitude comet appearing in Ursa Major. Zero magnitude. Yeah. Zero magnitude. It's lying. Really bright. Well, uh, so that magnitude spread out over the, about half the size of the moon. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't appear that bright. That's a good point, though. I really need to get out and try to find that. I can't find that. You find that in the backyard. But in any case, uh, you can lock on to what the telescope's pointed at. Or you can unlock and then go move around and then just look over here and find what the telescope's pointed at at some point. 
which I have done. I actually like doing that myself. Just go searching across the Milky Way, trying to find stuff, and then go see what it is. I used to have calls from one of our members who would point his telescope at something and then not know what it was, and he'd go in the house and phone me and ask me what it was. What it is. <laughs> so, anyway. It's a bright, shiny thing I want to use in Mariah. So that's uh, that's my story. I'm sticking with it. <laughs> what was that question? <laughs> All right. Like I said, I've got some uh, stuff up here. I've got samples of circuit boards and stuff. If you got questions, come up after the meeting, talk. Like I said, I got my Dobbs out in the back of my truck. Sorry. You gonna send the links? Well, it'll be online. It'll uh, be on our website. Uh, I, I can I can put it on our website, the presentation, yeah. but I can send the links out as well. So, be glad to. Fred, yeah. You know how your tube is, is uh, not is non-metallic. It's a uh, I've seen your tube. Right. Right. Your OTA. Sonar tube. It's and, cardboard. And so you know, your iPad. It's not going to interfere with anything. But I've read online on cloudy nights that sometimes you've got a metal tube that'll interfere somehow with where you're pointing it. If you try to put your iPad or something right on the scope, is it going to interfere much with the encoders? Or I mean, you can still hold it out here. You don't have to. No, it's right it's tube. no no. That's not right. Yeah, I'm just it's, telling you what I read. So so there's there's another way of doing this, right? <clears throat> iPads and iPhones have got all this, uh, these accelerometers and magnetic compass and everything. And actually what you can do is put a mount on your telescope that holds the iPhone yeah, I've seen those in too. the same direction that your telescope's pointed. Yeah. And it's essentially, without putting encoders on your scope, yeah. tells you what you're pointed at, kind of, sort of, and close. But you're right, a metallic... Uh, tube at that point can interfere with the compass. Did, you know, well, this is yeah, if, yeah, one. if you do it in that mode, right, so whatever you pointed at. It's got a little carrot, the little point, I mean, a little thing. There. Right. But I was wondering if Sky Safari had something like that. It, it's got the little bullseye, like you said, uh, like you'd see in a Telrad. It, it does, that. but you're not going to use it in that mode. I see. see, that mode is show me what the phone's pointed at. Yeah. When you do this, you want it to show you what the telescope's pointed yeah. at. And it's going to know that from the encoders, not from the orientation of the phone itself. Got it. So, at which point, the magnetic compass doesn't care. Well, I'm going to attempt it, but if I get stuck, I'll call you. <laughs> yeah, don't hesitate. The Dobson Dream 8. In fact, and, and in fact, uh, iPads. Uh, you can buy an iPad Air 2. Uh, no, no cell phone capability because you don't need it uh, for like a hundred, hundred and fifty bucks on eBay or some remanufacturer, re you know. So now all of a sudden you've got a dedicated uh, big screen device on your com on your telescope for for less than I paid for this mm -hmm. thing twenty something years ago. So. Uh, well, thanks. Any more questions? Yeah. Have you seen uh, Celestron just came out with a system where you put your phone on the, on the uh, telescope yeah. and use a mirror and the, use the camera to look at the sky and recognize where it is. And then it does give you arrows. Okay, cool. Push, you know, to the scope one way or another. <laughs> that is cool. I hadn't thought of that. That's cute. All right.